Good afternoon and welcome to the CIS, Centre International de du Sport, webinar number 13. Uh, you, you are still very numerous to come and very thankful uh, of your presence. So don't forget to subscribe. Uh, it's, it's, it's important uh, to, to continue to be in touch with uh, our listeners and uh, former students or future students, people who are connected to us and to the network. Well, uh, the webinar today will be uh, the follow-up of uh, what we had last week. Uh, we had last week uh, a, a, a webinar about discrimination in the Americas and the role of sport. And we will go a bit further in the discussion. We thought that one hour was not enough. And one of the speakers we wanted to add uh, was not able last week. So we will, we will have five uh, speakers this week. And uh, I will... Uh, start uh, with uh, uh, Nickel Moore. Nickel Moore was a uh, FIFA Master alumni from the 11th edition. Uh, hi, Nickel. I hope you're fine. Hi. How are you? I'm great, thanks. Uh, then uh, we have Kio Mari Lopez. Kio was uh, a student uh, of the 7th edition of the FIFA Master, and Kio uh, is from Puerto Rico. She's currently at the moment. She's in 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 in, in Dublin, uh, and works uh, as a financial fair play representative for the uh, Puerto Rico Football Association. Uh, then we have um, uh, Jeffrey Edwards. Jeffrey is an alumni. Of 18th edition of the FIFA Master, and Je Jeffrey is a president. Is currently the president of the. Uh, uh, futsal Federation in his country and he's a CIS coordinator uh, for the project we have in the University in uh, of West Indies in Port of Spain. And before he did the FIFA Master, he did as well our degree CIS, FIFA and University of West Indies uh, in, in, in the country. Uh, our uh, fourth uh, speaker is a uh, is a newcomer, and uh, we, we thank him very much to be there. Matteo Zuretti, Matteo is Italian, as his name says, but he works in New York for the NBPA, uh, the National Basketball Players Association. Uh, hello, Matteo. I hope you are fine, and he's joining us from New York. Uh, I'm Matteo, and uh, uh, I know he has, he has been doing some, some project jointly with uh, with with uh, Dino Ruta and, and our our team our colleagues from uh, from Milan. Well, uh, our fifth speaker, uh, Eden Gebre Selassie, is uh, is just joining us. She had some problem uh, to to, uh, to 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 technically reach us. Eden is a student from the uh, ninth edition of the FIFA Master. Uh, she is uh, uh, Italian American Eritrean origin. And she lives in New York, uh, did work for, before she did the master for Rolling Stones, did the FIFA master, went to the ESPN, uh, and, and is, uh, is, is very, very uh, interested in, in question of uh, sport and society in general, and particularly with the, the current discussion. Well, you know, let's, let's come back uh, to, uh, to uh, Thank you, Joao, for your, your positive critiques. Uh, let's come back to what we, we, what we said last week. And, and I think what was very, very interesting for us last week was the fact that we see that sports seems to, to have its own discourse in sports, in, in, in the discussion to the fight against racism. And for a long time, it has been seen. Let's let's move from Jesse Owens towards to uh, to, to to Nelson Mandela and uh, and uh, uh, François Pinard. Uh, by the way, François Pinard was a FIFA Master uh, patron uh, some years ago. Uh, but what was very interesting is his sport gave the impression it's a way to uh, to fight against racism. And what we saw in the recent years is maybe a a policy that goes uh, in the other direction. Matteo is working, I would like to start with you, Matteo. You're working directly and every day with uh, the players and with the sport where, uh, well, re racial relation is a, is, is a key issue and integration, understanding of each other. How does it work in the NBA and in the NBPA? Uh, it, it's, it's not easy, right? And, and good morning, everybody. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's not easy. and. 
I realized it very soon, um, me coming from Europe and from a country where, like Italy, uh, where integration, I think, has a, a, a long, long way to go still. Um, when I arrived to the U.S., I immediately realized that uh, um, I was looking at things without some key lens, and, and the key lens is the is, is the lens of race. Uh, I was coming from my, you know, European background, grew up in a liberal family. I thought I I, I had all the answer, and then I was coming in with no prejudice, and that 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 that's what I was counting on, you know, but then I realized that race was all over me, uh, all, all around me, everywhere. And uh, uh, I really needed to put the, that, that those lenses on to try to understand what other people uh, was actually looking and was actually seeing. And I think that's a process that can translate, um, you know, to our players that come from another country. 25% uh, of, our, of our members come from another country. And even some of them, who are black, there's a very interesting article that Clint Capella released in a, in a magazine in, a, in, in Switzerland, I'm happy to share the link later, um, where himself was, was underlining how he, as a black man arriving to America, didn't really fully understand, it took him some time to understand um, what, what difference there is in being a black man in Europe and a black man in, in America. I think, uh, I think, among our players, there's a great sense of awareness of how their voice can be heard. There's a lot of frustration, of course, and there's a lot, a lot of desire to turn what has been only a conversation into action. And so, what what we are really focusing on right now at MBPA, also with with the, with the support of our of our MBPA foundation, is how can we. Uh, walk together with our individual players so that their um, their their best intent their, can transform into meaningful meaningful and impactful action because again like um, many of them are younger are, are young men okay and and take some times um, to actually figure out uh, how you can transform all that frustration, that anger, that desire for change into practical and tangible action. And so that has been a, that has been a big focus. And, and not only from, from the institution we work for, but also, and as always, through the leaders, so that our, our more veteran players have been having a crucial role. So, for example, if I think um, about Chris Paul, who's our president, he has been really pushing hard and working with... Um, HBCU, the Historical Black Colleges of, of America, and you know that's that's tangible. Like you are empowering those schools. Through those schools will come the future uh, leaders, uh, or some of the future leaders among the, the black community. If you are widening um, and making, uh, you know, um, education, for example, as a more um, fair field and with more people having access, with more people of color having access, uh, we know that, that that's something practically can have, a, can have a, a big impact on the life of many. And that's, again, it's, it's only an example, but I think the support is twofold. Some of it comes directly from the players and again from the veteran players and uh, some of them come from us as an organization. We're trying to really support the players being successful in yeah. And it's uh, thank you, Matteo, because it's it's great to start with this because I think today what what would be interesting is is if we see if we can share uh, best practice examples that are working uh, things where where you know that can be applicable in other realities that that is uh, one of the elements probably is not just to talk but to share practices that works well and uh, is, is, is identifying the problem is absolutely essential and speaking it out. But as well, think what has been done and what can be done that is working. Uh, one one of the one of the main elements of that definitely is is the situation uh, for people who are dealing with different national realities. I, I wanted to 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 see from you your experience, Nikki. Nikel has been working for years in seeing how this perception of the American big model of the NBA and the NBA athletes and NBA as a 
Well, world integrated reality. Uh, how did it? How did it work in in your? I, I don't know which word to use in proposing, selling, showing uh, the the big element of fraternity and understanding in the in the NBA of people from different origins and 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 and, and other form of a a working. Uh, living together was it an element that that was important in uh, in understanding the NBA abroad? Yeah, no. Being being at the NBA itself and being at headquarters, and in my case, I spent a lot of time in our offices internationally and a placement also in uh, Johannesburg, um, which was responsible for looking at media across the con uh, across the continent. It's, it's part of the American experience, it's part of the American brand as well, um, that the differences in the way that the sport that you're looking at is very, very black versus the offices that you're walking around in, which are black, but um, certainly less black than you would anticipate given the percentages that are on the court. And more importantly, at senior levels, um, how you start to realize pretty quickly that there is a perception of um, the league, which is correct and, and, and definitely in line with their players' views as well, that um, are progressive in their thinking and, and very forthright in, in taking certain positions when it comes to race. I mean, looking at it across the region and, and looking at it from a brand standpoint, I always used to joke with my boss when we would be internationally that people perceive me as the brand and he not as the brand. Um, and he was a white man, right? So, um, you know, we would joke because we'd be going into meetings to do things like sell sponsorships or sell merchandising. And it was interesting, the first reaction, because people want, although they expect the brand to be black, they don't expect me to be coming in to, for example, to sell a sponsorship, to talk about our merchandising, um, licensing rights. You know, maybe I might come in to talk about hoops and, you know, basketball development or something. And so it, it's a strange dynamic because one, at your home base, you can already see um, the differences in the way the structure maybe takes from your talent and takes from your potential and to that end knows what to put out front. But at the same time, when it then comes for ascensions, promotions, opportunities, yes, there will be a representation of it, but you do see that the, the tiptoeing still happens. I love being part of that, um, of the NBA family. Um, there's, I would never trade that experience again for the world. Um, I think it's interesting now being on ownership side as well to see the perception of the league and the league and its players as oftentimes it feels like assets, right? Not so much as people. And, um, and that can be discouraging at times, but it's really important to be in the room to say, hey, look, there is no challenging of, you know, players' ability to speak on issues that directly affect their skin there's no challenging of players ability um especially in this moment uh to leverage those platforms including the ones that the teams uh, offer up um to be able to carry the the message that they want to carry this is an equal opportunity ship they bring the they bring and especially the black players bring value to your organization and now you will you will now have to step into waters that you may be a little bit uncomfortable with um, in order to respond to to the current moment and what they want to do. Perfect. Uh, I would I would I would like to continue and and ask uh, uh, Eden, Keo, and Jeff and Jeffrey uh, about how in their in in their daily relation inside in inside the the working in sports, the fact to, to not being white has, has made it difficult. And do they see any changes in the relationship of the others to you by this fact in the recent 
month, in the recent weeks, after talking about the, uh, uh, what has happened in the state. Um, I can start if that's okay. Um, now that I live in Puerto Rico, I'm Dublin for, for the summer, um, you don't see it as much, although people think that there's no racism or anything like that in Puerto Rico. It does, it does exist. But I want to share something that um, ties discrimination with mental health, and that's what some people haven't also realized. Um, when I went, to, I went to college to the University of Michigan, and I was a Latina. I was the only one in my class who had an accent. I was the only one who came from really far away, who had to cross the border from Mexico to come to the U.S., and I think that was a huge issue for me. And I think we have to keep in mind that discrimination, you can see it in different forms and shapes. And one thing that has happened that I've seen a lot is mental health. Um, at least for me, when I got to Michigan, you had to do a lot of, of presentations. And because I had an accent and because I knew people look at me differently and because they make all these jokes, it did affect the way that I saw myself and it did affect the way every time I had to do a presentation, I would get really nervous, it would go even worse. And it wasn't until I went to the FIFA Master it, where there was inclusion that I realized that it was okay to have an accent, it was okay to be different, it was okay to be a woman. And after that, I started gaining so much confidence in the way I spoke, in the way of presentation. Like at the end of the day, my presentation for the final project was great. And I think it's important that we talk about this stuff as well, especially in the Federation, women, um, there's a lot, football is not a big sport in Puerto Rico. Well, it wasn't until now. And there's this idea that men, it has to be men from other countries, not Puerto Rican. We have a lot of coaches from different countries. And then there's women. And I feel like we also have to keep in mind that it's just not the fact that you're Latino or that you're black or anything. There's also discrimination against people with disabilities. There's discrimination against women. There's all this type of discrimination. And it does affect your mental health. And I, I'm up for like, we all have to fight for different things, but always remember that players also need assistance and guidance in mental health because this can affect your game. And if it affects your game, it affects your business. If you don't want to see it in the way of racism, at least think about your business. Because sometimes the only way to get to people is to tell them that they're going to lose money in it. And I think that's something very important that we do have to keep in mind. And I wanted to share that experience with Michigan because I know it does happen to a lot of people and people don't talk about it. And it's not until you go to a different country that you realize you're okay, you're not different. Well, you're different, but it's great that you're different. At least that's my opinion on this. Jeffrey. Good morning, all. Um, it's very interesting because, first and foremost, from a Caribbean standpoint, we also, and a lot of persons think that the Caribbean is filled with Black people, yes. But we have to stop the denial of systemic, structural, and historical inequality, whether by gender or race, in this game called life with a greater commitment of integrity needed by all um, to move the conversation forward, for which we have to say thanks to CIS for doing that. With that being said, it is only until the, 2000, that the year 2000 that the West Indies Cricket Board had to abolish um, gender discrimination in cricket in the Caribbean as regards to its members noting that cricket and football are the two most popular sports because you had cricket clubs, established cricket clubs, and if it is persons want to understand the context of cricket clubs, cricket clubs are like fraternities, cricket clubs are like boys clubs, cricket clubs are like golf clubs, where women were not allowed. With that being said, in the Caribbean as well, in, the, in said cricket clubs, um, there are the elitists and there's colorism which ties back into racism. And we have to really and truly understand that we, are, we need to stop the echo side. We need to be committed to change. And we need to understand that we look, for, look forward to the future. Yeah. Uh, Eden, I, I have one or two things to say on that. But Eden, if you have any points to, to add at that point. You're on mute. I can't hear you. You have your microphone up. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Hi, yes. everyone. So if I if I may tie everything that is being said right now by all my panelists, I think that um, throughout my career in corporate America, a huge, um, you know, saying that, you know, HR and diversity and inclusion experts have always said is that in order for a company to be successful, each 
employee has to be able to show up to work as their full self. So to tie it back to what Kia was saying or even what, you know, from Matteo to Nikki and Joffrey, I think that the business of sports is unique because, you know, to make it very like a, a quick explanation, you have three big entities, which is the players on the field, you have the organization that the leagues, and then you have the owners. And, you know, everybody, I would say is in a yes for the love of the sports, but also is, is a business. So in order for um, people to be able to show the players in order to show up as their full self, I think that they have to feel, you know, heard, uh, which is kind of the same, um, you know, feeling that us as employees have to feel. So as I kind of mentioned last week, it's it's very important that, of course, you start with education of what discrimination in the workplace means or, you know, what inequality, why we feel like things are, you know, not equal for everyone. And so I think it's, very important that organizations and leagues understand you know if you don't want to do it at the human level even business wise in order for you know your players and your employees to show up as their full self and therefore you know work at their best you know things have to be equal and they have to be heard and they have to be able to show up at the workplace as their full self yeah uh, as as uh... Uh, Kevin Marston was just telling us in, uh, in, in, in one of the points he would like to point out, and I think it's very interesting. There we see a major distinction between Europe and the US, and the Americas in general, where uh, the league and the players and the owners are on one side. There is no federation, there is no administration, a centralized administration. Does it, does it help in fighting the racism, the fact that there is not these extra group, which is the, the administrators of the leagues, of the federations? If, if I may, from, from again, from a Caribbean standpoint, and what I'm seeing also in the US, um, is a lot of times the federations depend on corporate entities. And with that being said, corporate entities now have something called political corporate social responsibility campaigns which falls into my opinion tokenism so. which we need to stop we need to stop having bandwagonism we need to have stop having opportunism we need to really and truly have um organizations corporate entities who support sports within the caribbean and the americas um, be consistent with their actions as we say the old adage says um let's talk more action um and be positive with the long-term change as regards to this discussion as in terms of racial inequality and, and gender discrimination. Yeah. Uh, and, and as well, connected to that, there is a concept of role models that is absolutely essential. And I, I imagine that uh, for, for the, the, the Players Association, uh, this clear element that uh, you have in front of you, role models for the population, which impact do they have? What which impact is their attitude towards crisis? Uh, is there some guidelines given to them in the situation? That's that's kind of thing we're probably we have all to be aware of. You know, I th I think not really guidelines. Uh, it, what it was fascinating it was how at the individual level everybody, every single player was able to embrace this. Uh, this part comes away. So there has been somebody uh, who went and went on the street from day one, doing vocals, somebody else who was on the street being silent, somebody has had a different presence and leverage their 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 that platform their platform in a in a different way. I, going back to your point about um governing bodies here and and federation, uh, I'm a I'm a big believer of in in, in individual responsibility, individual accountability. Um, and uh, so if there is one thing that I believe uh, the governing bodies uh, could improve is education. Because the situation we are in right now is the result of many, many, many years of diseducation. Uh, we have 
and and these again I, I go back to my my personal experience i came to the us knowing almost anything about systematic racism and i was lucky that i that i ended up in this organization we have 65% of people of color my boss is a black african american woman um uh, and and uh, and that has really helped me uh, being emerged into uh, into an environment where uh, I was able to understand things. If I wanted to, nobody was coming to me like with the with the uh, racism for dummies book. But uh, I was never judged. I never felt judged. I never felt judged. I have a couple of friends here on the panel when we had conversation about that. Um, I'm grateful for all the people that hold me accountable. And sometimes it's tough. Okay? Sometimes it's tough. But I think that's our responsibility, individual responsibility to uh, make that effort, have those uncomfortable conversations. And, uh, and so governing bodies, how can we scale this to a, broader, to a broader number of people? How can we make sure that more people are aware of systematic racism that is not only booing in a stadium to a black athlete but it's much broader than that much bigger and that actually that boo in the stadium is only a consequence of this education and so i think we have to go and go all the way back to uh you know the foundation of of how we how we and this i say also as a father how we how we raise our kids and sometimes also as a parent it's tough. It's a tough job. Everybody says it's the toughest job in the world. I tend to, to agree with that. And so can governing bodies give us a hand? Can, can campaigns and messaging also leveraging the players in an authentic way um, help educate the next generation of, of, of kids who's coming up and hopefully have a completely different approach to this whole situation? Yeah. I, I think one thing that Mateo and Eden pointed out, so Eden mentioned about coming to work as your full self or coming to your job as your full self. I think one thing that federations, leagues, teams can do is just look at the rules that they have in place for the expression of their employees, particularly their black employees and their black players, or just generally. There's things Test within the rules, right? That one manages all how much one can speak for themselves. Um, there are things that on we talked about the dynamic before. Yes, there's a collective bargaining agreement that works in terms of the players in the league and their relationship. There's another thing that's an employee code of conduct that happens at league, federation, team level. Then there's the there's a ownership uh, operations manual which says where and how owners can support certain things. And these constructs in themselves continue to promote the systemic racism that we're seeing. So yes. the rules that are in there just, I really think there is something to be said for every one of those bodies that have some level of governing power, some level of a contractual agreement with people. Um, and especially in this moment with black people need to go back and say, wait a minute, something bigger is happening right now. These rules, this is showing us where our rules have bias already. Um, this is showing us where we're not allowing people to show up as their full selves. And especially in this moment when we really have a ch chance, and this is the first time, please believe, if you have Black employees at your office, they are not coming to the office as their full self, period. So, and anyone can fight me on that, I don't care. But I'm, I'm saying that to you because there's a real opportunity here where black employees are legitimately so fed up that they are definitely coming more with their full selves. And this is a true opportunity to do an audit of what is in your system and get probably more real feedback than you will have ever gotten before. Um, so I do, th I do think federations, teams, um, anyone with that contractual agreement, whether it be a CBA, an owner's manual, governing rules, has a chance right now to make sure that the system is being adjusted, all the rules, the constraints are being adjusted to allow Black people and other people to come to work as their full selves and really help you improve. This is the moment because if this goes, 
the honesty will just go right back in and everyone will keep coming back to work as 20% of themselves. Uh, it's great. Uh, I, I, answering already <laughs> the, the, the question we were receiving. I give you the, the floor in one second. Mm -hmm. uh, just we, we, had a, we had a question from, from, from uh, Tabo Ninsogang, who is a student of the FIFA Master Force edition. And, and Tabo was, was asking, uh, do you believe that the fight against racism in sport uh, can be won? Uh, and he, and he, he was asking, uh, uh, Sports Federation have for a long time tried and claimed that they are fighting racism. Do you think they are doing enough? I think you answered. I think you answered and you said that's a moment where to do something new. And it's, it's great uh, uh, that, that you said that, uh, Nikki, in, in, in that sense. Uh, Eden, uh, I give you the floor. So yeah, I, w I wanted to follow up on what Nikki was saying and kind of go back to the specific words that Joffrey used earlier. I think that um, a lot of times organization put racism under the umbrella of corporate social responsibility. And again, I want to go back to the fact that, you know, the better your players play, the better your, um, you know, non-white employees work the more money you make. So it doesn't have to be one just specifically attached to corporate responsibility, which a lot of times th that type of department is more of money out than money in. There's no ROI attached to it. So I think that it's very, it's imperative that people understand that the better your your workers work, inclusive of your players. I think we... Lost of, oh. You guys lost me? Yeah, no, it's fine again. It's fine again. Oh, okay. So I was saying there is, you know, ROI that can be attached to, you know, players and, empl and employees of non-white heritage, um, you know, to, to be able to pr provide profit. And then the second part of it, as Geoff Jeffrey mentioned about tokenism and, you know, performance, um, you know, allyship, I think that and I'm gonna call out the FIFA master. So since this happened over a month ago, I've reached out to all the FIFA master alumni groups that I'm in. And a lot of my call to action for them or even offering my availability and my knowledge and my experience was knowing that a lot of my alumni and you know uh, former colleagues are actually decision makers in different sporting organizations all over the world, inclusive of FIFA, you know, we happen in this panel, some of us to be here in America, but there's a lot of people that are spread out in Europe, Asia, Africa, and all over. And not one person, not one person reached out to either myself or Nikel. And that goes back to what we we're talking about education and what Matteo said about, you know, that it's tough, but it's through the tough conversations, it's through the tough and, and uncomfortable, you know, dialogue that you can only grow. And so to me, it's very worrisome and it makes me sad that all these people I've offered, you know, free consultation basically and to offer my knowledge and not one person. And I think at FIFA Master, there is a, at least 500 people at this point, if not more, that has reached out and asked questions. Um, so I understand people saying, oh, you know, it's uncomfortable. I don't want to ask the wrong questions. I'm afraid. But if if I'm offering, you know, uh, opening my doors and windows and nobody has accepted that, I think that goes beyond, you know, being fearful. I, I think that's kind of like being complacent and not, not really caring for change. And with that said, another beautiful narrative that has changed throughout the Black Lives Matter movement that is happening in America is that silence is compliance. So if people are being silent right now, you're not being anti-racist. If I may, if I may quickly jump in on that, and Eden, you had me on the edge of my seat waiting to jump in here because South African Anglican Bishop Desmond Tutu said, if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen a side, the side of an oppressor. And I don't want the FIFA master students to come all apologetic. I want us to be agents of change, change makers. Not because Eden call you out means that you all have to now come and be apologetic. It's very important that we understand that. Let's be.
the agent of change. Let's be the generation to be able to push, to, to push this conversation, not just a conversation, but actually act. With that being said, let's speak about representation. Let's speak about representation at all levels of the organizations that you lead, both in terms of gender and also race, to the point whereby some persons are calling for 30% quota. I don't believe in a quota system. We be, I believe in having competent and adequate persons. There was a brand in the United States of America in the late 90s called FUBU, for us, by us, a very urban brand. And that is how I feel. Let us, persons who are gender related and also race related, speak to us and for us. Let us be the role models. Let persons be able to see us not only on the football fields, but also in terms of when it is their pan in the boxes, see that we exist. So that we now can be able, so that persons now can be able, the younger generation, the next generation can be able to say, let's, we want to be like them. We want to work towards being just like them. I have something to add, and it goes along with what you guys were saying, what Nikki said about policies. Um, something that I've seen now that I'm in the legal world and world in the Federation drafting a lot of codes is that you need to see who drafts these policies and these codes, because if it's a white male man, policies and guidelines won't help because he has no idea what he's writing. Um, and every time I try to sit down and write a new code or a new handbook, I try to put myself in the shoes of that person that it's going to affect. If that, like, you need black people, you need Latinos, you need all those people there in the same table drafting that code, because if not, nothing will ever change. And I'm never going to listen to a code if someone brings it over who was done by a white person who has no idea what I've been through, who has no idea what he's writing. Like, it really just, like, doesn't work. And I think that's something very, very important that we have to keep in mind. Also, with regards to the FIFA master, um, as I previously mentioned last week, I think that a lot of people don't talk because they think it doesn't happen where they are. And first of all, you have to understand that racism and discrimination is everywhere. And you need to be willing to talk. If you don't understand, ask your peers. There's loads of FIFA master people who are from Africa, who are from the US, who are from Latin America. Ask them how they feel. And I'm sure you have some really close friends that wouldn't mind talking to you about it, wouldn't mind sharing those experiences. Because if not, you're always gonna say it doesn't exist. And it does exist. And it is affecting your close peers and you don't even know about it. Uh, I, I, Kio, I really appreciate you say that because I would like to, to continue and come back to one point Nikki made last week, which I think is very inter important to start with, is uh, words, using words, calling the thing by the, uh, be careful of what we say. You know, when we start comparing every time a, a black athlete with an animal, you know, it's not the intelligence, it's no, is a, a Eusebio is, is a panther. Uh, Keita is, is is a gazelle. So is is they are not intelligent. They are not. That's not their strength. No, no. They are like animals. That's a form of racism that is unacceptable. When you continue to say that the way uh, the the athletes are moving from one club to another, uh, not seeing the same reasons for when it is uh, uh, when it is a player coming from another continent is not a true national. We have to be careful in the wording we are using. And I think the media role is important. The academic and education role is absolutely crucial from this point of view. And I'm interested to, to know which kind of best practice are developing in the institutions, in the, in the schools, in the federations, in the clubs, by the players. Are they careful about, you know, we need to start in, uh, from, from ourselves, to, to, to not using, uh, all the FIFA master students know that I, I would never accept the term selling or buying a player because you are not selling, say, selling a player. The same way is comparing a player to an animal as always, especially is their strength comes from their, from, from, from their qualities, personal. It's, and it's, it's really a problem when, 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 when terms, uh, uh, we received this, this, this week from Eden, a paper that shows that there is, more often the newspaper will compare a black player to an animal. They will not say to explain the, the quality of the player, that it is intelligence, that is skills. Uh, no, no, it's, it's really uh, another way. We have to be careful about that. I think it is essential. Uh, it, it, a lot of questions arrived while uh, I'm doing that. If I may add to that, that's very interesting because we also have to change the vocabulary. Such mm -hmm. words such as blacklisted. 
we, we need to stop associating the color of someone's skin in this regards, given the fact that we're speaking about racial inequality to negativity. That is, that is very important. So the vocabulary and the sporting vocabulary needs to change. A lot of industries have their own vocabulary. We in sports, we also need to recreate our vocabulary. Hmm. Yes, definitely. Matteo, you were, how is it working with the vocabulary? Is the, is the players' union careful about the words the, the, the players are using or not, not too much? Not too much, because we want them to use their own words, you know? I think that's, this is fine. This is absolutely that's, part, that's part of, uh, of, of, of us uh, making sure that they have the ability to express themselves. Um, I have to say that our players, and I think in general, professional athletes in particular, um, are incredibly well-trained, right? Like they're media trained. So it's very hard for somebody to, to slip on something that is so obvious. But again, that's, that's not the most scary and dangerous side of things. It's not only when you go, you have a huge responsibility when you go in front of a camera, you say something, but it's, it's really your daily action and the way you conduct yourself. And I think, I think the fascinating thing for the players is that the players are somehow uh, forced to solve uh, the racism problem every day of their life. And, 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 and I'll say this, very often we, we give sports the, the merit to bring us together. And that is true because, for example, also for an NBA locker room, those guys are together only because they're playing sports and because they are. But the, the, the court, the pitch, this universal language of each individual sport, I think is a difference neutralizer, you know? And, and, and I'm not sure that's, that's, that's the best thing that can happen. What I'm more fascinated about is everything that happens within a team or within a player's body, if I think about our 450 players, in all the other environments, when they are on a bus together, when they are at a wedding together. I, I mean, I was lucky enough to be at a couple of our players' wedding. It was, there was one person from e almost everywhere. So yeah. in the world of different colors, of different cultures. And, and, and that is the proof that the guys are immersed in, into this environment that force them to fix that problem. They have their bias, of course, as all of us. They have their issues. It's, it's a path that they, that, they, that they walk every day. But um, I, think, I think by studying those dynamics, what happens inside the locker room, again, not inside, not inside the court or the pitch, but inside the locker room, inside the plane, inside the bus, at a wedding, we might find some of those some of those answers because you see this this young man just relating to each other in how we would dream our world to function right they just they just fix that problem naturally you're you're absolutely you're absolutely right and i think we do that in the fifa master center about nickel um i think one thing you mentioned was vocabulary and we also talked about best practices and I think that's where sometimes the vocab and the terminology becomes problematic. So if we're turning to kind of looking at solutions and things like that, a lot of times we do a lot of coddling for the issues that we have. So we'll say things like conscious bias, unconscious bias. We'll, you know, we'll say something like, you know, X training and Y training. And a lot of times I think what we do wrong is in fact in those kind of solution oriented elements. It's almost as though we're softening for the majority what we already know needs to happen, right? So when we look at different statistics and we, you know, we see things like, I read, I read different articles. I'm reading an article about uh, the Premier League and one of the comments that come out when they talk about solutions is we need the Rooney rule or something like this, right? And so we start looping our lives into these terms that if you actually dug into, you would realize did not work. So you need, if you wanna call it the Rooney rule, please say you want the Rooney rule 2.0 because there needs to be more 
in-depth understanding of how you get the results of representation and then thus what that terminology means. When you go into your house of whatever business or organization you're in, you're gonna find that you have your own internal language about anything that is uncomfortable and also just generally. Everyone has like 900 acronyms or something. But the, the next step to that is with that audit that you're gonna do of your organization. You know, When you start seeing, you need to start pointing out those things already. So there's certain steps that need to be taken, but in doing so, it's about being careful about the language and the terminology that you're ascribing en route to getting to a solution. Otherwise, you're just gonna end up back in the same place that we are right now, which is employing solutions that clearly have not solved anything. Um, I would say right now, for example, if I can just give an example of our organization, um, and I mean my, our company Emerson Collective as opposed to teams, I'm not exactly sure what's happening. Uh, specific to there. But a lot of what we're looking at now is how are we demonstrating in our assets and our action that we need to fix, you know, issues of lack of Black representation? How do our tools that we use not reflect actual equity? Are our, what does our grants portfolio look like? What does our investment portfolio look like? Who are the CEOs and the leadership of that? who is managing both the financial areas as well as the cultural areas. A lot of what you'll see a lot of the time is that diversity, equity, inclusion, HR positions will be led by people of color and oftentimes by black people. But then when you start looking at another area, whether it be the, the revenue driving areas or functional areas that matter for those revenue driving areas, that's when you can often start to see a default in um, where the organization itself functions. So, you know, it's, I think vocabulary and solutions come together because you'll find a lot of the times that how you define those solutions may have a definition that does not actually point to success, but more importantly, how you define those things can also inform your level of intent in how deep you want to how deep you want to dive into something. How much you use the word black? How much do you will use the word or the term Latino or Latin X? There's you know there's a million terms that people need to be able to kind of just dive into the discomfort of the term. Say to yourself, do I really care whether bias is unconscious or not? The fact is, there's bias. Like. And we don't like it, we don't need it in the system. How do we how do we uproot it if we continue to coddle our way through the vocabulary that we're using? Yeah, uh, uh, to that, uh, Gabi Andrade, former FIFA master student from the eighth edition said, speaking of language, what do you think is the role of sport commentators in educating fans on anti-racism language and attitude? I think uh, Eden is the more uh, uh, media oriented from her work. What do you think? So, uh, again, I think uh, in the, the question of the media is really important, but I, I think we, if we focus on the media, we're broadening too much the conversation and not focusing on the real responsibility, as kind of Nikki was mentioning, about each institution. I think that the MBA, again, I've never worked there, but as an outside, as an outsider looking in, has done a great job at you know, creating consequences for every time someone has said or done anything that it's, um, you know, racist, uh, either blatantly or not. Like when the Clippers former owner was caught, you know, using the N word. And even more recently when, you know, uh, uh, one of the owners was on, on, on the court and kind of, was it a Toronto player? I think that he pushed and he cursed that. So I think the NBA, has set the tone very uh, clearly about what's acceptable and what's not. I think finally, during this Black Lives Matter movement, the NFL, it's now starting to kind of set the tone, which then trickled down to the white players wanting to have a voice and wanting to be anti-racist and actively allies. And so even though I love what Matteo said, that of course, like in the locker rooms, you know, they have been able to kind of you know, at least live almost like a parallel life. I think only now after watching how George Floyd died, after watching how Amy Cooper, a white lady who claims she's not racist, obviously put another black man, 
you know, in danger of his life by knowingly and threatening him to call him to call the police because he's a black man. I think that, you know, those are kind of the tough conversations that need to be had and the the each institution, a sporting institution, has to make their voice heard has to clearly make like an an announcement of to the players this specifically for soccer fans like when you start chanting you know uh monkey chants when you start throwing bananas like how is that possible that that's still happening like to, to me that it's insane and you know i just saw how the premier league allowed you know their their players to kneel and to wear the you know black lives matter jerseys again that's very nice but for whom like that that doesn't do anything for black people whether we are spectators of the sports or specifically more the players because i'm sure that after they wore that jersey i, I mean was there a sit down conversation with their own colleagues who are their players they're supposed to be teammates so for me, it always goes back to, again, like educating yourself and really understanding what the issue is. But but the institution has such power that until they say something, I don't think much is going to change. And, you know, they say something and they make like tangible decisions and changes within their organizations, which can go from first representation to then, um, you know, true growth of their diverse uh, candidates. There are, uh, you know. Like yeah, for the last last eight minutes that remain remain uh, to us, I would like to give you all all four all five of you uh, uh, the time to 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 see where you believe uh, some best practice and some solutions and some key issues are. I know that we received uh, uh, two or three other questions, but I think at that time, I think you are important in showing us how, uh, from what you experienced during the last weeks and months, what what can be done, what should be done. It's difficult, is it? <laughs> I know. <laughs> I can so go. We'll start. We'll start. <laughs> um, first, I think we have to focus a bit of our attention to removing those economic barriers that there are. Those economic barriers help discrimination and reinforces. I think there needs to be equal opportunity for all and sports organizations, federations need to find a way to reach every sector of every part of the country to make sure that everyone has equal opportunities. Second, I think when it comes to an organization making a change, it doesn't, it can only be the CEOs and the players. I think you need to affect your community, affect your um, security, teach them about racism, teach them how to um, see how to tackle it, how when they come across it in a stadium, what to do about it. Teach your volunteers what to do about it. Because if you only leave it in the locker room and you only leave it in the CEO area, your community is not getting affected properly. So I think that once everyone inside a stadium starts noticing it and is able to pinpoint when it's happening, that's when things are going to start changing. I would also recommend, if it's possible, for players to speak out do certain like Instagram lives along with their CEOs, along with the big people in their clubs and have a conversation together, but the people can see it. And so that the CEO sees what the player is going up through, but as well the public. I think once you start showing people that you're making a change, like those players or those fans that are racist, they're gonna start noticing that it's not right. Maybe not all of them, but maybe you can help change a few of them. And I think it's important to see that clubs are doing it. Just, just put a Black Lives Matter logo on you, actually do something about it and show us what you're doing towards it. I think that's very important. Yeah, so you are in, 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 in Ireland, and I would like to, to, to remember the work of our colleague Ken McHugh and, 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 and uh, Sport Against Racism in Ireland, where they had so interesting programs, where they tried to include, yeah. include many things, to include a game, playing together, learning to know who, who the people are, and they try it on the field for years and years, and they are projects that works, definitely. And I think it's one of the example, sorry, of like people believing that racism doesn't happen in Europe. It does happen. I've worked here. Maybe you don't experience it in the same level, but you do feel it. And I think um, what um, Ken is doing is something very important. And it's something that makes other people realize that it's not only in America that it's happening, that we have to be aware that it happens all over the world. Definitely. So if I may quickly add to that, 
um, some of the things I'm going to mention as solutions are going to be repeated, but it's very important. So I'll start off first with seeing and addressed race-based in educational, economic, and environmental disparities. But when we use the word address, it's very important that you do it with compassion, you do it with consistency, and you do it with integrity. Gender and race equality um, needs to be looked at at all levels of sports administration, um, having persons being represented at all levels. Um, stop being apologetic and be change makers. And as we spoke about before, I'm going to repeat it. Stop tokenism, stop opportunism, stop political corporate social responsibility campaigns, stop bandwagonism if it is not consistent with positive long-term change. And on that note, if um, I would like to have a quote put up, please, um, by Councillor Cleo Lake, who is the former Lord Mayor of Bristol. And why is she important? Because she, in her first week, she removed the, uh, the, the portrait of slave trader Edward Goldstone. And this is, uh, this is my words for everyone. Hope not fair, unity not division, arms open not backs turned. Social justice is a must. Stop the ecocide. We cannot change history, but yet we can direct the future. Great. So that's from, from your side. Uh, uh, many thanks for 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 for, for uh, giving that that aspects. Uh, who's next? Who wants to 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 add some some issues? Matteo, please. I'll go. Um, I I think I said it already, but I really feel that the pillar, since it's a collective work, right, among us panelists, because it's something. My pillar is. I want to go back to education, um, and and I want to add this this layer to it. We live in a very noisy world, and uh, for certain messages to get across with consistency, like Geoffrey said, we will require uh, our best our best selves and our best minds because this noisy world we're living in is really derailing continuously ourselves from what is really important. Um, we were talking about words, and I want to just give an example. Nakel Nakel said. Uh, you know, uh, and 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 Eden, you know, they, they spoke together about like bringing your best self to work. I've learned that within the African com uh, American community, there is this thing that is called code switching. I had no clue. So <laughs> that's a word. That's a that that's a thing. That's that until you don't know what it is, you can talk about best self, whatever. Like it's a nicer way to say that. There are some black people that in, in their in, in at, at work they come in and they switch, they hit the switch, and they are just a different version of themselves. So I wish we would have <clears throat> more and more opportunities to widen uh, uh, our ability to 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 learn about about these things and to call them with the real name, right? And again, that's that would be the most authentic and probably in fact impactful form of education that we all need yes code switch is a great word absolutely who wants to be who wants to to uh to eden nikki do you have any final comments um no i i just want to say that i'm very glad that we have a white man representative on the panel matteo because as we keep on saying that the conversations are tough um, you know, and in order for things to really make change, you need to have those tough conversations. I think Matteo is a great example of someone doing the work, starting from you humble yourself, you then educate yourself, and then you become an active part of the change. So uh, I just want to kind of give kudos to Matteo because I'm sure it's scary to be around all of us. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, but no, I'm saying thank you for doing the work. Thank you for... <laughs> Being a minority in your workplace and and still you know wanting to learn and not like you know kind of not putting yourself at the center of this but really wanting to be a, a an active ally. So I just wanted yeah. to say thank you and yeah. I hope more people do the same thing. Yes, thanks, Mateo. And Mateo is in Wakanda for those who don't know. Mateo is. He's living this beautiful life at the NBPA. But um, I would just say for everyone on the phone, the first thing 
the one thing you can do and you have every right to do is demand an audit immediately. Like, just be like, look, I don't have to talk to you about the problems yet, but can we at least see where we stand? Like, say to your company, can we bring in a racial equity uh, consultant to do an audit? Like, if, if that's the first step, then maybe all of a sudden you can start having these conversations because that will entail several things. There'll be conversations had with different employees to surface issues, but then also it'll dig into the numbers of how your actual business is running and your rules and your HR policies, everything. So maybe that's the first step. But the other thing is, you know, there's this whole game of like, you know, we're in learning and listening mode. Well, you know, you also want to learn and act, right? It's We do it for everything else. I think if you enter the room and say, hey, look, I don't mean to offend anybody. I just, I'm in the process of learning, but I also know we have a timeline and we have a real chance to get this right. So help me, I will humble myself to take whatever feedback, whether it's cute feedback or whether it's harsh feedback, as long as we can just sort out the actual message that's coming from the feedback and then go from there. And then also stick your nose into everything. I'd say this, especially to my black colleagues, this is the time where nobody is kicking you out of the room. No one, they won't even try it. Just walk in the room, sit down, get on. I've gotten on conversations that have nothing to do with me. They're education grant conversations where I'm like, wait a minute. So how are, who's on the first, who's on the group that's making the curriculum? I am not, I have no education background other than being on the receiving end of it, but no one is kicking you out of the room right now. So you might as well just, you know, find the zoom details and just show up like so most assistants will give it to you right especially because in our world a lot of the administrative assistants are in flag black and they're ready to see stuff getting shaken up so they'll let you they'll give you the details and be like i don't know how that happened just go ahead and take advantage of this moment and insert yourself into the room and no one will stop you from bringing up a point about race racial equity etc right now absolutely and and uh well, I would, I would, with these words, uh, like to thank you all five. Uh, it, it was a pleasure to have you all here, and uh, I'm sorry for the questions that we didn't answer from the from from, from the public. But I think it, it it was important to have this second the, the second uh, uh, debate, which was really not repeating but following what we had last week. Uh, we will, uh, we will. Uh, certainly continue to get in touch with you. I know that there will be other webinars where part of you uh, are there that we need inside the policy of the FIFA master to imagine as well how this mod what it means to be multicultural. It's not so easy and it's not always how oh, it's nice we travel, we meet from people from other from other cultures. We have to adapt to them. We have to accept that realities are different and reality are uh, have, have to deal with each other, and it's it's absolutely uh, crucial for for developing uh, uh, society that is viable. I don't say that is better, but that is viable. Uh, well, thank you so much. Uh, we will uh, for a few weeks stop because we have too many final exams to do. But continue to subscribe. We will tell you when uh, when we when we will have our next. Uh, webinar from the CIS. It will be soon. And thanks again to all five of you and uh, uh, have a good week. Take care. Bye.